Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, an IMF loan, tax cuts for big business and austerity for the poorest, the perfect cocktail for street protests, we speak to the vice president of resource-rich Ecuador. A cash crunch in Kenya, East Africa's largest economy, can't pay its bills. Will it need to ask the IMF for help? And the king of streaming is about to face a multi-billion dollar onslaught from the likes of Apple and Disney. We'll find out if Netflix can hold on to its number one spot. Weeks of violent street protests were brought to a halt in Ecuador in mid-October after the president walked back on austerity measures. Lenin Moreno withdrew the International Monetary Fund-backed agreement to increase fuel costs. That decision had paralyzed the economy as it hit the poorest and minority indigenous population the most. Quito had asked the IMF for a $4.2 billion loan as it struggled to cut its budget deficit and debt. The government decided to cut fuel subsidies, which cost the government $1.3 billion a year. At the same time as receiving the loan, big businesses won a concession, wiping out past taxes, according to the former economy minister, Wilma Salgado, which raises the question, why would you take a loan to help corporations but cut subsidies to the poorest? I'm delighted to say that we have the vice president of Ecuador here to help us understand just what's happening in that country right at the moment. Uh, Otto Sonnenholzer is also an economist. Welcome to Counting the Cost. It's good to have you with us. Pleasure. Let's start with the issue of fuel subsidies. Was cutting fuel subsidies the right thing to do? But of course, I mean, anyone who says the opposite is lying. And I tell that all the time in Ecuador. Why? Fuel subsidies, specifically as we have them in Ecuador, First of all, they only benefit the ones who have the most. Those are the ones who have cars, who consume the, most quanti the highest quantity of fuel. It's just like that. We just had a study from the International Development Bank ratifying that 75% of the people who uses, who benefits from fuel subsidies are people who don't need them. And I have nothing against subsidies when they're necessary and they go to the people who need them. But in the case of Ecuador and fuel subsidies, they just don't. It has costed the country more than our GDP, if you put it together for the last 45 years. And it has no economic sense, no social sense, and of course, no environmental sense. So something that makes no sense, why would you keep it? You say that they, that they weren't needed. Why, why then were there protests when they were abolished? So we had the first step, we took the first step last year, we had no protests. And this year, you have to combine different factors. And we just found that out when we managed to handle things. Because if you see the region, and not only the region, if you see any other countries, many other countries, mostly in Europe, uh, they also have protests. And the problem is not how many people are protesting. The problem is how they behave. That's what's changing in the world. If you see the levels of violence that protests are reaching, that's something to worry about. In the case of Ecuador, we had 11 days of protests. And at the peak, we had only 150,000 people protesting. It's a 17 million people country, right? So we had 150,000 people protesting in only seven of the 24 provinces. So it wasn't, if you count, the, if you make the numbers, it wasn't such a huge thing. It was mostly concentrated on, on one very important uh, demographic in Ecuador, which is the indigenous population. We have 7% of indigenous population in Ecuador, and they were protesting mostly them. And it, does, it didn't come from, from the urban sector. It all came from the rurality, from the, from the fields, from the countryside, and from the highlands. That we are, we, are, we are approaching those issues. We're bringing solutions. We just managed to reduce this year 5% rural poverty in Ecuador. That's a big number. That's a, a big result. But still, there is so much to do. And then you have an additional matter in the region, specifically in, in four countries of the region, and that's Venezuelan migration. In two years, just in Ecuador, 500,000 Venezuelans have created a difficult social environment. And when I mean difficult, I mean there is difficulties with employment, there is difficulties with opportunities, because it's 500,000 people that we weren't counting on. And nothing against Venezuelans. These are good people that are trying to find a future. We are all migrants. Look at my face. I mean, I'm migration personified, you know. So. Uh, but it's tough for a country that is also struggling with its, with with its economy. 
we're doing our best. So you talk about the, this in, indigenous population, the people who yeah. are at the core of the, of the protests in Ecuador. Uh, why do they feel that they're not economically safe or that they don't have economic prospects un, under, under your government? Are, are they economically safe? No, in general, they feel like the rural sector, mm. in sector area, the rural area, in which the main activity is agriculture, they feel that the country has lacked an agricultural policy that helps them. They feel that the country, not in our government, I mean in the last 20, 30 years, they feel like the country has lacked a, a development policy altogether that helps them out. And I think in most terms they're right, but we're working on it. But still, there is so much to do in education, in health, specifically in the rural areas. Again, when I go into the communities and I ask them personally, I do it myself, I go, I visit, six, seven, eight communities a day when I'm back. And that's how we, that's how we manage to, to control protests. Uh, and I ask them, why are you protesting? They say, they never mention fuel subsidies. They say, this is because I heard that you're giving subsidies to Venezuelans. Uh, that's not true. We would love to give subsidies to everyone who needs it, but we have a close, a tight budget. We cannot give subsidies to everyone, so we have to select the people properly. But the most important question I ask them is, has anyone here in 45 years of fuel subsidies in Ecuador, has this policy helped anyone here go out of poverty? No one raises their hand because this is a failed policy. So what we wanted to do and what we, what we proposed is to take fuel subsidies are 90% of our budget's deficit, right? If we eliminate that, we're all set. So what, what, what we proposed is to uh, direct at least a third of those, of those, uh, of that money, of the subsidies money, to development projects yeah. and to direct monetary transfers. Yeah. Right? That was a proposal. And when I explain it to them, they say, "Why didn't you do that? Yeah. Why didn't you do that?" And I say, "Because you didn't let us." Okay. Right? But, but why? Why would you forgive um, corporate taxes, which, which, if if you uh, hadn't done, you could have covered. Uh, much of your budget deficit. In, in what fact, case? You, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't, I mean, is it right you tell me, would you not have let, uh, needed an IMF loan if you'd, if you'd not forgiven uh, corporate taxes? We haven't forgiven corporate taxes. Okay. What we did is we passed a law one and a half years ago, mm. a law that has been passed in a similar way, I mean, an article in a law that we pass almost every four or five years in Ecuador, and that's also one of the, another of the fake news, right? We had debt mostly from small businesses and, and, and persons, people, like not, cor not corporations. Mm -hmm. We had debt in taxes and in social welfare, because you have to pay social services, also an amount every month. And we have a development bank for agriculture, for small farmers, right? So people who owed money to those three institutions could pay the amount, the capital amount, and you will get an exoner exoneration on the, on the fines and some of the interest. And many people need that to come out of a problem. Because if you, if you lent, if you got a, a loan for $5,000, let's, let's say, right? And it became 10,000 because you couldn't pay it on time, right? You will, if you couldn't pay 5,000, you won't be able to pay 10,000. Mm. So we go back to the 5,000 and refinance that. So 95% of the people who benefit from that decision were small and micro companies. The smallest, right? The ones that we need to support. Mm -hmm. And then 5% was cor large corporations. But again, it only helped us to collect taxes on time. We didn't, we didn't uh, let them go of the, of the obligation to pay taxes. What, they, what we did is we eliminated the penalties and then we collected the money. Money that serves exactly the people who need government attendance. All right, so, so how- attention, sorry. How, how do you plan now to, to, to bridge the, the budget deficit? So we have working, as you said, we have been working with the IMF, with the World Bank. We have a financial program. And I mean, we don't go to the IMF or to the World Bank because we're crazy. We believe and we see a possibility there to find loans in better terms. Instead of borrowing at 10 or 12 percent interest rate, five years, eight years, we're getting uh, we're into a program for $10 billion at 4% interest rate, 30 years term. So 
Of course, that's a better option. And all they want is that we, uh, we bring order into Ecuadorian finance. And that we have to do with or without the IMF. Ecuador is a dollarized economy. You cannot have deficits up to 8%. That's what President Moreno received, 8% fiscal deficit, right? Today, we're around 3%. We have done our job without the IMF, because that's what we have to do. We know it's not popular, right? No one, no one wins an election uh, cutting costs, right? But that's a problem. Every four years, governments want to, spare, to spend more than what they have. And in the end, what you have is a huge debt and no will to bring order. What about VAT? Would, would, it, would it have been better, perhaps, to, to, to raise VAT to cover some of those costs, which is, I think, it's what all, the, the IMF Okay, was, so it's all, that's also an unpopular decision yeah. that has to pass through Congress. Mm -hmm. We just passed a law in Congress, a, a law that will, will allow us to collect taxes. There are mostly green taxes and healthy taxes, right? 500 million that we need for next year and for the, for the whole fiscal plan. But again, if you have something that is so wrong, because it is completely wrong, like fuel subsidies. Listen, this is crazy. The same indigenous leaders that were leading the protests in Ecuador were just last week at the COP25 in Madrid protesting against fossil fuels. Mm. So who understands? And, and, and right? what is, what is, so yeah. if you have something that is so wrong, mm. that costs all the Ecuadorians $3, uh, $3 billion a year, that has costed in the last 45 years over $100 billion, you have to fix what's wrong first. So we, have to, we want to start with what's, with what's wrong. Mr. Vice President, uh, it's been an honor to speak to you on Counting the Cost. Many thanks indeed for being with us. No, thank you for the interview. A pleasure to be here. Now, Kenya is in the midst of a cash crunch. The International Monetary Fund, the lender of last resort, may line up a loan to make sure that East Africa's biggest economy doesn't succumb to an economic shock. So what's gone wrong? Well, President Uhura Kenyatta has promised to create one million jobs a year. And to do that, he's been increasing spending on health care, manufacturing, agriculture and housing. Now, the country has increased its debt to 62% of gross domestic product in order to do that, which means that it's spending a third of its revenue on servicing debt. And worse still, the loans aren't cheap. It went to the markets to raise some 7 billion euros. That means there's less money to pay contractors, forcing the government to increase the debt limit to $87 billion. Now, ahead of elections in two years, there seems to be little political will to downsize the civil service, which eats another third of the country's tax revenue. It appears the government was oblivious to the fact that it breached its legal debt ceiling of 50% of GDP in 2015 and 16. The infringement only came to light after a new team took over at the Treasury after the previous finance minister was charged with graph-related offences. And it couldn't come at a worse time. Bridges and roads have been destroyed by flooding. Lives and livestock have been lost. And there's expected to be more flooding. The economic cost of that is yet to be determined. Let's get more on the situation with Elisa Strobel. She's a senior economist, sub-Saharan Africa economics and country risk at IHS Market. Good to have you with us, Elisa. This uh, cash crunch has meant that companies haven't been paid, uh, jobs have been lost. What sort of damage is this doing to the economy? Perhaps have to look at the latest business sentiment readings uh, that have indicated that um, employment levels have gone up slightly in the month of November. However, the latest business sentiment readings have also indicated that firms reported to be more cautious about uh, economic activity in the next year. Uh, with that said, um, and also the consideration that um, global macroeconomic fundamentals are expected to be less favorable next year, we expect to see uh, a slowdown for Kenya's economy. Currently, IHS market forecasts a growth of 5.7%, which is a slowdown from 6.3% last year and 5.8% this year. Um, perhaps on a more brighter note, uh, we do expect to see um, private borrowing to increase in the near term. Um, that's thanks to the latest interest rate cut by the central bank of 0.5%, um, as well as the removal of the, in 2016, introduced interest rate cap. That should somewhat um, offset the current cash flow uh, problems. Um, we have to also keep in mind that 
uh, besides the job losses we've seen, uh, the cash crunch has also caused sticky uh, non-performing loans on the banking sector. So with the removal of the interest rate cap, we do expect to see some uh, improvement on this front that will ultimately hopefully support uh, aggregate demand in the near term. The president's plan to, to solve this is laudable, but could it have been achieved without resorting to something like 7 billion euros of, of expensive loans from capital markets? Yes, indeed. Um, we have seen uh, Kenya tapping into the international market around three times over the last five years. Um, unfortunately, given the downbeat performance of revenues, there's little room uh, to really uh, include non-external financing to Kenya's uh, major and uh, large uh, projects uh, involving infrastructure and economic development. Uh, we have seen that the uh, tax to GDP ratio last year has been in decline by not one, one percentage points. And uh, non-tax revenue uh, has, has shown a even weaker performance. Um, so the outlook does not look too good for revenues in the coming years. Um, one way of perhaps dealing with uh, the current situation and something what we have seen uh, in the East Africa region is that governments, in order to address their fiscal consolidation, uh, is to reprioritize their uh, investment spending away from uh, large greenfield uh, mega projects more into refinancing the already existing infrastructure network, particularly those uh, investments that have a high return on investment. Yeah, there's been a lot of debate about, about the infrastructure projects, particularly the ones that, that, that China uh, is, is ultimately building and that Kenya is paying for. I, I mean, that's been a, a significant uh, factor in this, this cash crunch. Yes, indeed, it has. Uh, if we look alone uh, into the distribution of loans from China to Africa over the term 2010 to 2017, we see that Kenya is the third largest recipient uh, following Angola and Ethiopia of Chinese loans. Um, the uh, export import bank of China is the largest lending institution on the continent and key partner for Kenya. Uh, financing its uh, mega project, the, uh, the, the, the standard Gauk railway that has commenced operations in 2017, taking passengers and uh, last year also cargo and freight. The overall loan uh, stood at a 1.6 billion US dollars in commercial and concessional terms to be paid back in 15 years. Kenyan authorities have expressed that the current numbers of passengers and freight transport will be not sufficient enough to generate the required uh, revenue that is uh, required for the uh, repayment uh, of the loan. Ultimately, uh, concerns were raised that as an alternative, uh, the only way to, 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 to get these uh, revenues uh, done for the repayment is by increasing tax, but that again has been opposed by the opposition. Yeah. Could, um, could, sorry to interrupt you, could the debt have, have been restructured perhaps sure. with, with uh, loans from uh, the, um, the World Bank, and uh, the, the African Development Bank? Yes, and ultimately it's uh, necessary for Kenya to, to, to do a restructuring plan in order to address the current cash flow crisis. We have seen uh, since 1990s uh, um, restructuring operations are taking place three times um, that have helped the economy to manage its debt load alongside the government's uh, needs in, uh, on the domestic market to refinance expenditure. Um, the IMF has uh, expressed last year uh, concern that uh, debt costs are reaching unsustainable levels, hence has raised their debt distress uh, rate risk from a low to, to uh, moderate. Elisa, really good to talk to you on Counting the Cost. Many thanks indeed for being with us. My pleasure. Now, Cord cutting, peak TV and the rise of so-called over-the-top services or streaming to you and me. Are we witnessing the end of television as we know it? It's estimated that 63% of people watch their favourite shows online and more content companies like Disney, HBO, Peacock are launching their own services.
Now, take a look at this. The industry leader, Netflix, saw 13.2 million people watch Martin Scorsese's epic gangster movie, The Irishman, in the US over the first five days after its release. It's spending billions on content and has more than 100 million subscribers worldwide. But Apple is spending $6 billion on content, including spending a reported $300 million on The Morning Show, starring Jennifer Aniston. Amazon claims that it signed up millions of people after paying 90 million pounds for three years' worth of English Premier League games. Joining us now from London, Daniel Gadha. Daniel is a research manager at research and analytics film company Ampere Analysis. Good to have you with us, Daniel. Ultimately, what's going to determine the success of these streaming services? Does it all come down to budget? I think budget is very important, and, and we've seen that from the likes of Netflix and Amazon, who have been investing heavily over the last few years in original content as well as licensed content. So with original content being one of the cornerstones to um, the new streaming platforms, allowing you to engage with consumers and bring them onto platforms. So, so that is definitely part of it. But then being able to develop a wide array of, of content for customers is also important. But is there room for all of them in the marketplace? I mean, consumers surely can only afford maybe one, perhaps two streaming services. And it's, it's the outliers, the people who are there first, companies like Netflix and Amazon who are in the lead, aren't they? Yeah, they, have, they definitely have a strong market position at the moment. And these new, new companies coming in, like Disney and, and, and a lot of the studios, do have a lot of uh, content to lean on. Uh, and ultimately, I think, in their current form, this many uh, services might be difficult to sustain in the market. What we may see is some of them adapt and change. Apple is a good example of this, where they could become more of an aggregator of content, producing a few of these original contents to, to, to bring people on platform, but then also bringing other services there so you can get it through one, one platform. Now, the elephant in the room is that these are all... American companies, where's the international competition coming from? And does international competition stand any chance? Well, I think this is one of the challenges a lot of the, the larger streaming platforms are facing. Local content is definitely uh, on the up and, and is what consumers want. So there could be room there. Local, local content being produced by local producers. And, and there's definitely an opportunity there, whether that's working with the streaming services or breaking in on their own. I think that there could be an opportunity there for lots of local platforms. Can Amazon break the sports market? Do you think it's going to go all out, for instance, for the English Premiership rights or, or even US sports, for that matter? So initially, Amazon, as I said, you know, they're, they're taking an aggregator platform approach. They've dipped their toes in the water in, in, in some of the sports. Uh, in the UK, you know, you, you've mentioned the, uh, the the Premier League. They've also just gained the rights for, for the Champions League in Germany. Um, but Amazon, I think, at the moment, are trying to bring people within their prime ecosystem so they will spend money in, in the e-commerce platform. So at the moment, I think for, for Amazon, it's about using um, content, whether that's sports or uh, drama, uh, TV content, to bring people within their platform. So I don't think we will see them go all, all out to collect all of the, the Premier League rights, um, but I think they will cherry pick uh, as and when uh, rights become available. And, and what's next for Netflix, do you think? Netflix is focusing very much on original content, and, and we're going to see that investment grow over the next few years. With the likes of, as I say, Disney, NBC, starting their own platforms, uh, they will be pulling their content from Netflix. Uh, so this really puts the impetus on them growing their original content and building that catalogue uh, to support all of the customers that they currently have. Uh, and what, I'm going to ask you again something you were talking about a little earlier on. Are, are consumers going to be willing to pay for all of these platforms? So what we've seen, I think, in lots of different markets is slightly different uh, trends. So in Western Europe, we're seeing uh, consumers stack a lot of these streaming services on top of their pay TV, pay TV platforms. In the US, we're seeing more of replacement. At the moment, we haven't, I think, reached that point. But as you say, with lots of these new platforms coming in, are we going to start falling over that edge of, of, of having too many of these platforms? And will consumers have a base pack of two or three platforms and then dip into others? Uh, I think it's all going to change a lot over the next few years, and, and that's what we will see. Uh, and do, do these platforms, the, 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 the success or otherwise of them, um, sound the death knell for traditional broadcasters, for free-to-air services? 
I think there could be opportunities on, on both sides. With, with the free-to-air broadcasters, their, their specialty and, and, and where their expertise lies in that local content, and there could be an opportunity there. More and more consumers are moving online, not just younger consumers as well, so older consumers. So these are the things that I think need to be considered uh, by the local broadcasters as to adapt to, to, to the new world. Daniel, it's been great talking to you on County of the Cost. Many thanks indeed for being with us. Thank you. And that's our show for this week. If you'd like to comment on anything that you've seen, particularly our interview with the Vice President of Ecuador, you can tweet me. I'm at A. Finnegan on Twitter. Use the hashtag AJCTC if you can. Or you could drop us a line. Counting the cost at altazero.net is our email address. As always, there's plenty more for you online at altazero.com slash CTC. That takes you straight to our page. And there you'll find individual reports, links, even entire episodes for you to catch up on. But that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Adrian Finnegan from the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for being with us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.